Welcome everyone. My name is Emma Koth. I'm from an organisation called Rocket Cedar. Uh, we're based here at, um, at Melbourne Connect, so we're, we're very lucky to have this um, lovely venue um, to, to be holding this um, panel event in. And um, before I go ahead and introduce everyone else on the panel, I'll just do um, a welcome to country. Um, so I, I would like to acknowledge that this event takes place on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay respect to their elders past, present and present, and to any elders who may be with us today. So, we're going to talk about the future of food essentially here, uh, specifically synthetic biology uh, and the application of synthetic biology or SynBio in the food and agriculture sector in Australia. So first on my left hand side, your right, I have Natalie Curick from Ginkgo Bioworks and I will allow um, Natalie to explain uh, what ginkgo is and why ginkgo is in Australia now, which is really exciting. Then to um, Natalie's left or right for you, I have James Ryle from VAL. And on the end there, we have Tom Davies from Change Foods. So thank you for joining us. I know it's been a, a very busy day for you, all things sell ag and so forth. Um, Natalie, um, <clears throat> I might get you to um, firstly introduce yourself and Ginkgo, but also um, given that you're much more qualified to, to, <laughs> to be talking about synthetic biology than I am, I'll get you to explain um, what synthetic biology is and some, maybe some examples of, of the application um, of SynBio in the food and ag sector. Sure, sure. Um, I'm, I'm Natalie Kurek. I am a, I, sh I should stop saying new recruit. I've been working with um, Ginkgo Bioworks since May. Ginkgo Bioworks is a Boston-based synthetic biology company um, and have just recently come to Australia to um, conduct business development activities and look for opportunities here in Australia. Um, um, where can I start? Ginkgo or Synbio? Let's start with Symbio. Um, Symbio is um, a way of engineering biology. So that can be anything from plant cells, microbial cells, um, all the way through to mammalian cells. And we can engineer now, um, we have enough sort of accumulated knowledge over the decades of biological research. And there's also been this convergence of multidisciplines to come together. So we, synthetic biology is um, molecular biology, it is cell chemistry, it is the convergence of robotics and high throughput lab laboratory procedures, and it's also then the combination integration of very complex computational capacity underlying all of that wet lab capability. So um, we adopt engineering principles of um, design, build, test, learn iterative cycles of that engineering. Nothing is perfect the first round. So we have this constant refinement and improvement. And where Ginkgo comes into play is that Ginkgo has a cell platform, a cell engineering platform, which enables very high throughput activity. So this iterative cycle can be done on a massive scale. Um, we can process thousands and thousands of strains and cells and look for options, um, um, which traditionally would have been, you know, taken years if not at all, if not at all addressed at all. Um, so that's the strength of Ginkgo. Ginkgo then also has um, this uh, aggregated learning um, database, if you like, which we refer to as code base, and everything within that accumulation of knowledge is then used for any experiments thereafter. And um, that's what differentiates Ginkgo really from, um, I guess, smaller entities and perhaps newer ones that haven't been around for so long. Um, okay, so that's Symbio, that's Ginkgo. Um, we are... Um, our purpose is to um, make biology easier to engineer, and we do that through the technologies and this convergence of multidisciplinary elements to it. Because we're a platform technology, we have relevance to a whole array of different industries. Um, we, we work in pharma and health, um, um, modern um, precision health, gene and cell therapies as well. Um, we have um, projects that span materials and fine chemicals. And then we also have projects which, which are involved in the food and ag space. And that's why I'm, I'm here today. 
Um, within the food and ag space, <clears throat> Um, agri-technology, I guess, and um, if you want me to define the agri-technology is everything from farm to the whole customer experience and consumption. Uh, so that whole umbrella term, um, there are many elements where synthetic biology and, and ginkgo can play in that whole um, spectra. So uh, the three probably main elements can be kind of classified as um, alternative protein products, um, food processing and additives, and also, um, what's the other one? <laughs> Agricultural systems, so literally on farm itself. So we, um, we have projects that work in farming sustainability, so soil conditioning, development of soil plant microbiomes for increased nutrient fixation, for instance, increased access to nutrients for plants, better health, better sustainability. We have projects that uh, span insect and pest control, for instance, where we take molecules from nature and apply them in a more sustainable, environmentally friendly way um, for applications on farm. Um, and then if we're talking about the alternative protein space, I mean, Tom and James have probably got more to say about that um, with their companies, but, um, you know, making um, food additives and food ingredients that can go into plant-based alternatives to meat, for instance, or um, dairy proteins um, without the cow. So we can express these, which means um, make them. We engineer microbial cells, much like you have, you know, champagne made from a yeast. It's a similar process uh, broadly where um, the yeast is churning out the dairy protein or the protein that makes the, the lentil burger taste like meat. So um, these are all possibilities. It's all food safe. It's technology that's been going on for a long time for the manufacture of pharmaceuticals, for insulin, for various other um, um, components of our foods, um, cheese and, and rennet, for instance. Rennet used to be harvested from tummies of or what ungulates, uh, which is not great. So you know, this way we can we can produce it on a on a large mass scale, smaller footprint, more sustainable. The boys again, we'll talk more about that. Um, um, and what else? Yeah. So that's that's all the different applications that you know. And then there's also things like food processing and additives, flavors, fragrances, um, extracting things that you would normally have to extract from the rare flower that grows on the hillside. Um, we can now get yeast, which will grow easily in a big vat and um, to produce that molecule of interest. Um, uh, additives, enzymes to break down yeast, amylases for, for beer or for any other sort of food production process. So this is the breadth of what the technology can do in just by engineering biological systems. Yeah, great. And of course, um, Ginkgo is based in Boston. And mm -hmm. um, if I'm not, um, if, if, I'm, if I'm correct, it's, um, Victoria, it's, it's the first Absolutely. office outside of the US. Um, or, uh, not, not technically. Quite. <laughs> yeah, maybe not quite. Um, as well. We still have a couple of yeah. offices um, internationally because we yeah. have um, acquired some smaller companies that have tech that we've brought in house. Yeah. Um, but yes, um, a, a, an office that's been constructed um, uh, through the actions of mRNA Victoria, and we're very, very grateful for the opportunity to come and form part of that pipeline of um, sovereign capability in mRNA vaccine development. So it's it's been a great opportunity for us. Yeah. So whilst you're here, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we can utilise Ginkgo. Absolutely. And Ginkgo's platform um, for the, the food and agriculture sector here. Uh, so very exciting. Thanks, Natalie. Uh, so James, um, you are quite familiar with the University of Melbourne. You've been here for some time, <laughs> but you've um, made the move into the, um, a different world. Um, so I'll, I'll allow you to introduce yourself a bit about um, your background and, and VAL, what you're doing with VAL and what VAL are doing. Thanks, Emma. Um, yeah, look, it's, it's so great to be, uh, to be back at Melbourne Uni. Um, I, I'm almost a bit of the uh, part of the furniture here. I've, I've been associated with Melbourne Uni for around about 25 years. Um, I did my undergrad and my PhD and my postdoc work, early postdoc work at Melbourne Uni. I then travelled overseas and spent five years at the NIH in the US um, that researching skeletal muscle stem cells and muscle development. But even during that time, I was associated with the university um, that because I was on a, um, a government-funded position to go and work in the US. I came back to Australia and returned 
to the University of Melbourne my entire life outside of those five years was, was in about a five kilometre radius because I lived in, in Parkville um, for a lot of my life as well. Um, and uh, I started up a small research group at the Centre for Muscle Research um, at the University of Melbourne and spent seven years researching again muscle stem cells and how they interact with their environment. So all up, that's, it's about 25 years. And in 2019, I made the leap into industry and joined Vow, a, a cultured meat company, um, as their chief scientist. Um, when I started, um, it was the two co-founders, um, myself and one junior scientist. Um, so we were a group of four. Since 2019, Vow has grown to a company of over 60 um, that we are in the process of building our first factory. Um, and our goal is to produce products that are consumed by billions of people every single day. Um, and the products that we're making is cultured meat. Um, and we can talk a lot more about what that does and doesn't mean. Um, that, but uh, to put it simply, we take a very, very small amount of, um, of muscle from an animal. So about the size of the tip of your little finger. From that, we're able to isolate different cell types um, and we can grow those up to huge numbers um, in really large bioreactors. Um, and theoretically, we can grow these cells indefinitely um, so that we can produce from this single tiny little biopsy, we can produce hundreds if not thousands of tonnes of meat um, that, that we can then sell to consumers. Um, that the, I think coming back to some of the things that Natalie spoke about, um, Biology is the most advanced manufacturing thing in the entire world. So if you think about a, a manufacturing plant based in, in Asia that is producing your iPhone, that entire manufacturing plant is dedicated to producing one thing, and that is an iPhone. You think about a cell. A cell can produce tens of thousands of different proteins, and the same cell can produce all of these different proteins. And based on the signals that it receives, it can drastically and rapidly switch from producing a lot of protein X to a lot of protein Y. So we have this incredible little manufacturing plant that we can dictate what it produces. And what Ginkgo does so well is um, identifies what are the signals required to push those cells to produce certain protein outcomes. What VOW is focused on is how do we get those cells, those little manufacturing plants, to replicate and grow themselves to just a massive, massive scale. Um, and the, ultimately, the goal is that we want to be able to produce this, this cultured meat product that, um, that it really takes the animal out of the, um, the food system. So we now only produce the cells that we need to create the food that we want to eat. We take out the antibiotics out of the agricultural system. Um, and it, one of the great things about using uh, bioreactors that are driven by electricity is we can use renewable energy to drive all of these changes as well. So we can cut out carbon emissions from the agricultural system as well. Um, so that's the, the long-term goal of what Cultured Meat seeks to achieve um, and what VOW is, is hoping to achieve as a company as well. Um, and just as a, a final little plug, our, our first product will come to market in Singapore at the end of this year. Mm. And why is that, James? Why Singapore? So, at the moment, there's no clear regulatory pathway in Australia um, that, uh, to, uh, to regulate um, that product, uh, cultured meat products in Australia. They're absolutely something that we're working with, and the Fasans is just a, a, a fantastic group of people to work with um, to regulate these products, but we haven't yet got to a point where they are, there is a clear regulatory pathway um, in Australia. Singapore has, um, a couple of years ago, they um, came up with a goal that they wanted to produce 30% um, of their, um, their country's food inside the country. Um, so Singapore is a massive importer of food products, um, but they, they recognise that that's a massive risk to food security. Um, so they came up with this goal of 30 by 30, and that is 30% of their um, food consumed by their country will be produced um, inside the country by the year 2030. Um, and um, Singapore is now the only country in the world that you can purchase cultured meat. Um, that, so in 2000 and, um, that 2020, in December of 20, um, 2020, the very first cultured meat product, a chicken nugget, was released uh, to the market. And so if you travel to Singapore today, you can eat cultured meat um, in that country. Mm. 
Thanks for that, James. I might go to Tom now. So, Tom, if you could just introduce yourself again sure. um, and uh, talk, talk a little bit about Change Foods as well. Um, so, my name's Tom Davies. Um, I'm the VP of Research and Operations for APAC for Change Foods. Change Foods is a precision fermentation dairy company. So, we use precision fermentation to create um, proteins um, used in dairy. Um, products and our focus at the moment is on cheese because it obviously has um, very broad commercial application um, and the caseins that we can create using precision fermentation lend themselves towards cheese. Um, obviously the science that we're uh, working with has broader application um, and hopefully um, as we continue to develop and evolve we'll see a lot more products um, come to market using that, but for the moment we're focusing on, on cheese, um, cheddars and mozzarellas uh, specifically. And part of the reason we're doing that is because, um, I guess, when the company was founded, which was in 2019 in Victoria, it was founded by a vegan named David Booker and uh, he just desperately missed cheese. And uh, he recognised that plant-based cheeses just weren't doing a fantastic job as a substitute. Anyone who's had plant-based cheese um, knows that often they're not functionally or texturally um, right. They don't brown, they don't stretch, they don't melt, they don't taste the same. Um, there was this big gap in the market. And as he began to research um, alternatives, he, re he recognised that there was an enormous... Um, toll that was being taken on, on the planet um, through the creation of cheese because the best way of making cheese at the moment is through animals and animals are incredibly inefficient. Um, they leave a big toll on the environment. Um, there's obviously ethical issues associated with them. Um, they require huge amounts of feedstock. And from a security perspective, a food security perspective, um, it leaves us very vulnerable um, in terms of you know, foot and mouth. If that was to have come to Australia recently, um, what would have happened to our dairy supply? Um, we've already seen dairy farmers in Australia leave the industry um, for a whole bunch of reasons. What does that mean for Australia as a manufacturer of um, dairy and cheese products? So as we began to look into that, he recognised that science was a much better way um, a much more efficient and cleaner way of producing um, these proteins. And so that was sort of the genesis of the company and I guess that's our goal in a similar way um, that Val's focusing to do it for meat, we're looking to do it for dairy. So that's dairy proteins and dairy um, fats, uh, recognising you need both um, the structure and the texture and also the fats that give it the flavour. So that's the background to change um, and we've grown from... to one person and an idea in 2019 um, to a few, I think we're about 25 at the moment between Australia and the US. Um, and uh, similarly, we're sort of working very hard to get a product into market um, in the near future. So um, everyone always asks us, what does it taste like and does it perform? Um, I haven't tasted it per uh, personally, but people in our lab certainly have, and I've seen um, the stretch tests and the melt tests and everything else. And I can say it's going to be very exciting when it finally hits the shelves. Great, Tom. So founded in, Change was founded in Victoria, um, but now headquartered in, in the US, um, in California. So why is that so? Uh, look, it's, it's, the reason we headquartered in, in California is um, because we were able to access funding in America and overseas that we couldn't access in Australia. I think the funding landscape in Australia has changed somewhat in the last three years, but certainly when we were first having the conversations with traditional VCs here, they just didn't understand what we were talking about. We weren't um, a bunch of uh, computer programmers working with computers who could you know, create an MVP and get it launched in a couple of months. We were asking them to um, believe in the science, believe in a scientific process that is not necessarily easy or true. Um, it doesn't always follow exactly what you want it to do. Um, you know, Natalie spoke about that engineering process of testing and evolving and um, thinking about what went wrong and going back and re redoing it and evolving and um, constantly, I guess, improving. Um, and that's very risky and it requires a lot of capital and it requires a huge amount of investment. And Australian VC funds um, 
weren't willing to commit at that stage um, and we couldn't get support from the government. Um, they weren't interested in, in what we were talking about. Um, and so we went overseas because overseas we had, I guess, more progressive um, VCs who were thinking about the bigger picture, who were thinking about the environmental impact, who were thinking about the future of food. And they were saying, if we are going to feed 9.8 billion people by 2050, and they have the same protein demands that we do, how are we going to do that with the current um, level of food production systems that we have? And the answer is we cannot. And so something needed to change and they recognise they need to be investing in those new technologies that we as a society need to be investing in these technologies because we will all benefit and we can't possibly um, achieve food security for the world doing what we're doing at the moment. And I think th those type of uh, VCs were very important and instrumental. And a lot of the VCs that invested in us, and I think have invested in, in James's company as well, they have that mentality, they have that bigger picture, that longer term thinking, um, and they recognise the need. And, you know, they're all, you know, they're called Green Gen or Blue Horizons or, you know, XYZ kind of high impact focus. But that's very much what they're doing is they're taking a bigger picture. It's not just about a monetary return. It's about an impact return as well, which I think is incredibly important. Great. Paul, you've mentioned some of the challenges. Are there any other challenges that you've um, come across, come up against um, in the last few years with Change Foods that you'd like to share? Um, Oh, look, every company has its challenges, um, and particularly at early stage, um, we've generally been been pretty lucky. I think the challenges that we see are more the challenges on the horizon, Emma. So um, when we're beginning to think about the regulatory environment, which James has articulated very clearly, um, what does that mean for Australia and how do we bring product to market? Um, I think about the issues that we will have in scaling manufacture. Um, the manufacturing required for these kind, to get to the scale that James is talking about, where we're producing thousands of tonnes, or in our case, millions of tonnes of cheese or dairy products, is just inconceivable at the moment. Um, you know, we are literally producing tens or hundreds of kilos and have that capacity. But even if we took the entire global capacity to produce this stuff right now, it would, wouldn't even feed the people in this room for a year because no one has invested in this capability up until now. And the types of plants we're talking about building cost hundreds of millions of dollars. Now, that sounds like a lot of money if you put that in context of, you know, modern manufacturing, food plants, it's not a huge amount of money. But if you think about the scale that's required, um, the CSI report, I think, recently said we need to have 175 large-scale manufacturing facilities in Australia alone just to meet 10% of the demand for dairy if we're going to use the type of technology that I'm talking about today. And you think about each of those plants costing hundreds of millions of dollars, that is billions of dollars of investment. So where is that going to come from? What's the environment that we are going to create or the government's going to create to help um, bring in those public-private uh, partnerships, to bring in industry funding to support the creation of that? Because otherwise, how are we going to achieve that goal that we're all working so hard towards? Right. Thanks, Tom. And James, um, you mentioned the regulatory um, hurdles and, and the fact that you're going to Singapore because it's, um, it's, it's legal there uh, to, to sell, um, you know, sell based meat there. Um, so what are some of the other challenges that um, Val have, I mean, you don't have to list them all because there would be, a, a, you know, if you have anything to do with startups, <laughs> particularly at the early stage, there's hundreds of issues and, and challenges that occur every day, but maybe some of the main ones. Yeah, and look, I, I think Tom started to touch on this as well. I mean, given that change wants to grow millions of, um, uh, of tonnes and, and Val wants to grow billions of tonnes of, of product. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the talent pipeline um, is the challenge at the moment, is where do we find the people who are going to run this pipeline that produces millions, billions, trillions, whatever? Where do these people come from? So um, with the three of us have been discussing all morning um, that, uh, about talent that is required to support this growing industry of synthetic biology and cellular agriculture and in both Australia and around the world. Um, and to give you an idea of how challenging it is to find talent, um, especially in the area of bioprocess development, Moderna 
um, that has recently said that they're going to open up a facility at Monash University, um, that, uh, at another university, um, uh, not Melbourne University. Um, they've said that they want 200 bioprocess engineers um, that when they open that facility in about 18 to 24 months. Trying to find two or three or four highly qualified bioprocess engineers in Australia at the moment is incredibly challenging. So the demand for highly skilled bioprocess engineers is it's going up exponentially. Um, and at the moment, we don't have the education pipeline and the training pipeline to develop these people that are going to support this, this brand new industry. Um, and that's really scary because it suddenly it becomes the bottleneck for how quickly we, we can all grow. And for companies like Change and Vow and, and many of the other startups across Australia, um, that we need to grow quickly. Um, so Vow did an, an internal calculation um, of that if we, if we grow and quadruple our output every year for the next um, that, uh, 10 years to 2032 um, or 2031 when, when we did this thought exercise, we would produce enough product to displace a very small farm. Now that's crazy, right? Four times growth year on year for the next 10 years. And at the end of that, we're displacing a very small farm. If we're talking about trying to become a company that feeds billions of people every day, four times growth is not sufficient. We need to be thinking about 10 times, 15 times, 20 times growth, year on year. Um, and if we're going to do that, we need to have talent to support that kind of growth. So I think that is, that is by far and away the biggest looming challenge for the industry of synthetic biology and, and cellular agriculture. Great. Thanks, James. Good point. Uh, Natalie, do you have any other challenges uh, for this sector? Um, well, from Ginkgo's perspective, I guess we are, um, we're established, I think, 2008, nine. Um, and, you know, we're, we're, we're a success to date. Um, we went public in September at the New York Stock Exchange and raised $1.6 billion. So whilst our mentality is still startup um, in terms of our culture and our can-do attitude, I think, um, I guess we can tick a box of saying we're on track. Um, our clients include everyone from um, example of well, not yet. Haven't signed them up yet. But as demonstration, um, you know, small startups, uh, two, three-man operations, all the way through to the large multinationals that you know, Roche, Pfizer's, um, Bayer. Um, um, so um, we have relevance, we have scope, we have capability um, to address. Um, our problems are, are growth as well, believe it or not, um, growing fast enough to, to service the interest and this industry because it's really taking off, not just food and ag, but across all that span of industries that I mentioned earlier. Um, so um, I don't know. Yeah, the challenges of rapid growth, I suppose, and that goes. Um, staffing is just as, as maybe not quite as much an issue for Ginkgo, um, but you know we're very aware of that as well. Um, the across the across the world, it's a it's a real issue, and um, you know making e visas faster and more accessible for bringing people to Australia, skilled workers, is not necessarily the only solution. There needs to be a domestic training and education to to bring people in with relevant background knowledge. Um, it's, you know, it's techie, it's heavy, it's really knowledge-based kind of industry. It's diverse um, in terms of the knowledge base that you need to operate in this space. Um, and it does take such a, a, a breadth of information and, and knowledge to, to come on board with these industries. Um, so there's so much opportunity though. It's just, it's just amazing. So if you're in computer tech or if you're in biology or stem cells or chemistry or engineering, robotics, data software, um, bioinformatics, it's all highly, highly relevant and applied in, in this space. Mm, very exciting. Yeah, really. it is. Yeah. Yeah. Is that, just on that, yeah. that point, I, I think it was fantastic to see um, that at the careers fair earlier this week or last week, um, Ed Husick talking about the need to bring in a lot more skilled immigrants and that Australia is going to um, significantly increase the, the number of people that we bring in. And it's the only way that we're going to be able to support the growth of all of these companies 
um, that looking for the next couple of years, but it has to be coupled with changes to the way that we think about educating um, as well, that there is a need and there is a demand um, for these types of advanced manufacturing skills. Um, uh, and so we need to be training the workforce of our future um, that, to come in and work in, inside these companies. Otherwise, we're going to miss out on this massive, massive opportunity. Mm. Great. And yeah. James, while we're on you, um, well, you've got the spotlight, um, I guess, can I ask you, that, that's one, I mean, you've, that's a key issue um, and it's, you've congratulated uh, uh, um, Ed Husick, Minister Husick and the, the current um, government on, on, on that. Is there anything else that um, you would ask, I guess, of, of the um, federal government, I guess, and state governments uh, uh, in this space? other than supporting um, the, I guess, supply of, if you like, um, STEM uh, talent into this sector? Yeah, so I, I do think there's a real opportunity um, that for the, the Minister for Science to, to really embrace um, that this coming, um, it's not even an evolution, a coming revolution in the food sector and the agricultural se sector. Um, the, the, the public really needs to know that the Australian government supports and backs this, this brand new technology that's coming through and has the opportunity to really, really secure um, Australia's food supply um, that for the next decade and beyond. And with climate change having such an impact um, around the world at the moment, it, that impact is only going to get worse. And we have this technology, we have this ability to really secure our food supply for the next 10 years and beyond. Um, and the, the general public's acceptance and uptake of this new, um, that, this new food um, source really needs to be led through um, that, both the work and the education that companies do, but also from the Australian government um, as well. And so um, Tom and I, Tom can comment on this as well, um, that we're talking about what can the Australian government do? Um, and it's so much about um, that giving credence um, that to this industry um, and providing financial um, the incentives and, um, the, and tax incentives and, and just including and thinking about um, sell ag when talking about ag tech in general. Um, that food tech is, um, sorry, ag tech is such a, a massive broad umbrella and yet it has so many definitions depending on who it is that you're talking to. Um, and cell ag is often sort of excluded when we talk about ag tech um, and that's a missed opportunity. Ag tech, sorry, cell ag absolutely needs to be a core pillar under that umbrella of ag, uh, um, agricultural technology. Yeah, and it's really about taking um, the sort of a, a food systems view or a systems view of the food sector um, and looking at that issue um, from the perspective of food security, um, perspective of, um, I guess, you know, educating our workforce and, and there's, you know, it's, it's such a huge, huge industry in itself and, yeah, really it's, it's best to do that from a more sort of food system strategic perspective, then you're not going to miss out on these opportunities and we won't be left behind, I guess, and hungry, um, <laughs> essentially. I, I, if I could make yeah, a raise, um, um, it's not necessarily a question of either or yeah. in terms of traditional agriculture and food production. Um, it's talking about supplementing and enhancing and the talking about the increasing global population and the need for for more food. It's talking about risk um, and climate change and having coverage during those extreme events. Um, so, and also um, from my perspective as well with Ginkgo, we're making largely um, ingredients and components of food. So um, it's not 100% necessarily that comes out of out of the fermenter and onto your plate, so to speak. But um, there is our ingredients and components um, which um, are replacing a traditional um, agricultural source in order to get this feeding of nine billion type exactly. goal. You took the yeah. words right out of my mouth. Yeah. <laughs> that's yes. what I was going to use in my um, summary. Of the okay, session, sorry. That's okay. We've that's still fine. got. I'll do it again. <laughs> uh, so, Tom, um, have you got any uh, an ask? I guess um, for for the federal government in particular, um, how they can support this sector going forward. 
Um, look, I think uh, from a federal government perspective, um, I'd echo James' sentiments. I think I would like to see a broader food security policy that addresses many of these issues that we're talking about and having an honest conversation with the Australian public around where are the sources of our food and what's the level of impact that we're willing to um, accept and the level of risk around the sources of those food. Um, Natalie's point is spot on. You know, we have to have a holistic view. We can't exclude traditional farming, um, but we can't rely on traditional farming to deliver the, the requirements going forward. And we also need to have backups because if traditional farming was to be decimated by foot and mouth, as that example that is still relevant in my mind, um, where are we going to get our dairy products from? You know, we had issues in after the floods um, in central New South Wales where you couldn't get ice cream and, you know, the price of milk jumped by 80% um, in certain... And that just happened off the cuff um, straight away after a whole bunch of cows were swept out and suddenly we didn't have enough cows to be able to produce the dairy that we required in Australia. So it's not just about um, removing a particular source of or, or production um, method, it's about supplementing that and providing alternatives. And food security policy, if that was directed from a federal government, allows us to have those conversations, allows us to have a mature debate around where we're actually going to be producing our food. How do we produce it? How do we distribute it? How do we provide access to it? Um, so I think that's a first element. I think um, certainly the training and development and what we can do to um, promote science. I think for too long now, certainly the last 10 years, uh, we've almost had an anti-science view and I think that's really disappointing. I think scientists and engineers um, have so much to contribute and we need to recognise that and reward that and be celebrating their contributions and harnessing the, the, the power and the brilliance of these people because we need to, as a society, get them to solve some of the most difficult, complex, technical challenges. You know, um, it's not easy to get a protein um, to be, you know, put it into a yeast cell and get that yeast cell to um, grow just that one protein that you need in optimal circumstances. Um, it, in theory, is possible, but it's actually very difficult in practice. And to scale that into the, the, quali the, the quantities that we're talking about is incredibly difficult. And it's very complex and we need to have bioprocess engineers, we need to have chemical engineers, we need to have food scientists, we need a whole host of people who are dedicating themselves to this end uh, goal and, and working together. And I think we as a society need to do a better point of encouraging people to get involved and, and doing that in a whole different way from computer scientists through um, to, you know, marketers and everybody else. So that's, I guess, the second point. And uh, the regulatory environment needs, uh, which we've spoken about, needs to be improved to, to allow us to actually create these products in Australia and sell them um, in shelves. Um, and I guess lastly, the um, from a state perspective rather than a federal perspective, I think state governments need to do more to encourage a vibrant ecosystem. And that could be funding of um, labs, it could be funding of research facilities, it could be funding of um, even, you know, equipment, providing equipment to universities. Because at the moment, when you speak to universities, we just don't have enough of this equipment. We just don't have access to it. If there are startups out there who have an innovative way to produce XYZ um, protein or um, a new you know, food type, um, been added to you for a flavouring or whatever, how are they actually going to get access to the labs to be able to do that? At the moment, it's virtually impossible because those, there is no space there. Um, and so we need to have a conversation around what we can do to encourage that, to support that. And I think, to their credit, some of the um, states are beginning to do that. New South Wales announced $6 million yesterday for synthetic bio, um, which is really exciting and, and that's fantastic and that's about encouraging the, the ecosystem. But I would love to see the other states do a similar thing. And $6 million is great. Um, it's a fantastic starting point. But, of course, I want more. Mm. So just on that, that point... <clears throat> I think we've spoken a lot about um, asks from federal and state governments and and how th those things might work. But I 
I think another core or key ask for me is for those in the university sector as well, mm. is figuring out how do universities work with smaller startups? Universities are not set up to partner with small early stage startups in a really effective manner. Um, universities are built for those, those partnerships with your Pfizer and Sanofi and um, the, the much larger pharma companies. And so figuring out what are the policies for how you deal with IP that is generated from those partnerships. We were talking about um, that the training of um, bioprocessing engineers. Universities don't have the, um, the, the ability um, really to have large scale bioreactors running to teach students. Um, that when, we, when we run um, our multi-thousand litre bioreactors, these are not cheap things to run. Um, and universities just don't have the opportunity to have that work at that kind of scale. So how do you partner with a lot of these early stage startups that might only have five, 15, 20 people at a time, but are really on this accelerated growth course how do you partner with them in a way that allows your students to come in and get hands-on experience um, that, in a way that's not detrimental to the startup as well? Um, and I think that um, is a, a really key ask for me, um, f specifically for the University of Melbourne, but more broadly for all universities as well, is how do you build those strong, lasting relationships in a way that is mutually beneficial? Yeah, I, I would echo that uh, very strongly. That's certainly been our experience, you know, where we've had students who've done, brilliant students who've done masters um, in molecular biology, but have spent less than eight hours or 10 hours in a lab over the course of their entire degree, which is just astounding to me. And so we then have to do a lot of training and development of those students. Um, we were talking about as a group, the idea of vocational training and internships, and how do we per perhaps think about uh, you know, in, in Australia, our traditional education pathways to allow for more collaborative approaches to developing these skill sets and allowing people to work in industry or encouraging students to work in industry to gain this experience that they can then know what a lab looks like, they can understand what it's like to turn up and work in a, in a scientific lab um, every day, they can understand the outputs what's required, uh, they gain that first-hand knowledge and that's a benefit to them and it's a benefit to us and we need to be doing it as an industry but also we need to have the framework and the systems in place for those skills to be recognised um, and for that to be funded, you know, either by the government or partially by us but it needs to be done because at the moment it's very much the training happens and then it's kind of off you go into industry and let's hope that what they learned at university is applicable and often it's not. Mm, yeah, lots of food for thought there. <laughs> Sorry, I had to say that. Um, Natalie, have you got any further um, comments? Uh, well, um, my plug for Ginkgo would be that um, let us help you um, and perhaps the ecosystem, once it's thriving and set up, there's more money in it, there's more moving parts to it. The quantums of money are then sufficient and um, for bringing in, you know, service providers, if you like, for, for these, um, the growth of these com of your companies um, and such. Um, so from us, from our, my perspective, from Ginkgo's perspective, um, small company success is, is our success and we can help out uh, technically if, um, with what we do. We can expedite products to market. We can, we can save you investing in the infrastructure we have it in place, it's highly refined, let us do it rapidly for you in 12 months um, rather than, you know, looking for staff, looking for labs, looking for instrumentation. Um, that's my plug, I won't say any more about that. But, um, but no, we've been, it's, yeah, there's lots of opportunity here in Australia um, in terms of food and ag being a major sector, the health and pharma sector is also very active. Um, big industries like mining and things like that. So, and, and a very um, environmental sustainability awareness in Australia generally. So um, a lot of these technologies are very um, sort of low footprint compared to traditional methods. So um, there's an openness and a, and a possibility for someone like Inco and for companies, these um, smaller companies to really make a big, make a big impact here. Um, 
it's it's a, been a real privilege to have the Victorian government sponsor Ginkgo coming coming to Australia for this initial initial period of time, and I see this being a very long term and successful relationship um, because of the opportunities that are here. Um, but like like we've been t discussing, um, the success of this ecosystem um, is is everybody's success. The rising tide, all boats and all mm. that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I think. Um, you know that both Paul and, and James were were talking about, um, you know, or Paul in particular about different state governments, um, you know, uh, their initiatives and um, with the federal government, uh, it, it would be ideal um, from an ecosystem perspective um, for these governments to be working together, not in isolation. Um, and, and with industry, obviously. So if we were all working in an ideal world, collectively focused on, you know, the end goal, um, perhaps, you know, if there was a food security um, strategy at the national level, uh, then we could all work together more effectively and, and achieve some of these things. Um, any last words, James? Val's hiring. <laughs> Um, uh, always. Um, no, look, I, I think we've, we've covered everything. But um, yeah, synthetic biology is such a, a huge opportunity um, at the moment. Um, and food agriculture, um, cell agriculture, again, it's going to become massive. Um, the, the amount of um, private equity money that has gone into cell ag um, over the last three years is in the many, many billions of dollars. Um, that, so that, yeah, there's just there's so much opportunity there for us, and I would love to see Australia leading the world um, that with something like this. We we still have an opportunity to to lead in this area now if we take action. Um, and so yeah, that would be my my biggest message is let's let's take this opportunity um, and drive it at government at um, the, the, the higher ed sector and the, the private sector. Um, and drive it across all three um, because it is such a great opportunity. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, James. Very inspiring. And Tom, any last words? Uh, look, I would echo it. I was going to say the same thing. I mean, I, we, I guess I would urge the Australian government and governments for all persuasions and, and indeed Australians to get right behind this because it is an incredible opportunity. There is, we as Australia, as, as a country have incredible natural resources in the form of our people, um, sugar, which is uh, vital, um, access to green energy. There are a bunch of reasons why we can, if we act now, actually be at the forefront of this and make a real impact. We have incredible scientists. We've been scouring the world for um, great scientists with deep expertise in bioprocessing and molecular biology. We've been all over America at the moment. The last three people we've hired were all trained in Australia. It's, that's not coincidence. It's because we've got fantastic universities that are producing brilliant people who have the right skills and expertise. We do have that here. We need a lot more of it, but we already have that as a base. So we have the human capital. We have the natural resources. We have the sun converting green energy. Um, and, we have and, and we have a reputation for producing high-quality healthy, nutritious food and being a food bowl. And we've got a lot of um, industries that are already existing here that produce food and export food. So we have a lot going for us, but we can't rest on our laurels. We have to act now. We have to move forward quickly to take advantage of this because otherwise it will disappear and other countries will invest rapidly and we'll be left behind ruining our opportunities. Great. Thanks, Tom. Very good, important call to action there. Um, just, I, I have a plug too, um, if, I'm, if you will allow me to have one. And uh, that is that Rocket Cedar uh, has a program, for a ag tech program. Um, again, you know, our definition of, of ag tech is, is broad from farm right through to the consumer. Uh, at the moment, we've um, got a program with the, um, supported by the Victorian government. It is just a pre-farm gate. We'll be scaling this program beyond the 
um, Farm Gate and beyond Victoria next year. So um, please, if anyone would like to be part of this, um, please do, whether that's a university, whether that's a corporate that wants to be involved and, and um, you know, get to know some of the startups and definitely, you know, people with ideas. And it's just a pre-accelerator. Um, so you only have to come into the program with an idea. So whether you're a researcher, we've got the support from all of the universities in Victoria, as well as the Victorian government, um, Agriculture Victoria. Um, you can be a post-grad student, you can be a farmer, anyone can do this program with a good idea. And um, we'd love to have you and, and please apply. Uh, the next program starts in um, February. The applications are open on our website. Um, I'll just sum summarise our, our panel session today. Um, so key opportunity, obviously, um, synthetic biology in the food and agriculture sector is a huge opportunity, also an imperative um, to feed 9 billion people. So it's not just about feeding Australians, and we're pretty lucky here, particularly in Victoria or South East um, Australia, having access to wonderful natural you know, dairy products and meat products, um, but we realise that we are lucky uh, and not everyone else in the world is lucky and there's going to be a lot more people in the world and we need to find ways. Thank you, Val. Thank you, Change, to, um, and Ginkgo uh, to, to feed these um, 10 billion people. Challenges, in summary, um, access to talent is probably the main one that we discussed today, access to capital. Um, I think, you know, that's changing in Australia rapidly. Um, I think, you know, there are only a few VCs in particular um, that, um, or investors that focus on, on this sector. So we'd like to help, I guess, you know, educate other investors in Australia um, and, and also, you know, welcome investors from other parts of the world, including in Asia, which, you know, we're part of Asia, so it makes sense that they invest in our sector here. Um, and also that, um, um, you know, community and regulatory support as well um, to create that environment where we can produce and sell cell-based um, meat and dairy products uh, to supplement our existing traditional proteins in Australia. So that pretty much summarises, I think, um, what we've discussed here and um, which is fairly wide ranging, but um, I hope that you've all enjoyed it and online as well as um, in the audience here in person. And thank you very much um, to Natalie, James and Tom for sharing all um, of your, you know, wonderful knowledge and, um, you know, plans for the future. So thanks very much. Thanks, Emma. Thank you.